everybody. This is Bob Goodwin, and welcome to another episode of Career Club Live. Uh, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, please feel free to like, subscribe, and comment. We'd love to hear from you. Um, also, uh, today's episode is brought to you by our newest service called Next Placement. If you're an HR professional faced with the unenviable task of needing to uh, transition some employees, Next Placement is our innovation in the outplacement category, where we're bringing a more people-centered, empathetic approach to help folks as they move on to the next step in their career. You can learn more about Next Placement at career.club. So today I am really uh, pleased and privileged to welcome our guest, Anna Maria Sankovich. Anna Maria, or AMS as she's known, is the Chief Talent Officer for Royal Caribbean. And today we're gonna be talking about how to bring uh, clarity and simplicity to the critical function that HR plays and, and back to being people centric, how to make HR more about the people. Also, we're going to geek out on neuroscience a little bit. Uh, I think that uh, AMS has got some really interesting perspective on how to tailor communications with uh, a broad workforce so that they best resonate. So with that, AMS, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. It's a pleasure being here with you. No, it's so nice to have you. Now, where the heck do we find you today? That looks pretty in the background. In the port of Miami, in lovely Miami, Florida. <laughs> All right. So I hope you enjoy a beautiful, another beautiful day in sunny Southern Florida. Here, here. So as is our want, we always like to help folks uh, just sort of get to know you as a person first. So uh, a couple of little icebreaker questions. So where were you born and raised? Uh, born and raised in Romania, actually, um, wow. and my parents and I moved here when I was about nine. Nice. Uh, northeast first, and then um, down down here. Oh, cool. So see, this is the fun part about icebreakers, um, is that uh, I've got a friend who's got a, a pretty interesting development in Cluj, and I wouldn't know anything about Romania were it not for my friend doing some cool stuff in Cluj. So there you go. Wow. Um, and where did you, so you came to the States, where'd you go to school? Uh, all in or around Philly. So um, Bryn Mawr, Haverford, um, initially undergrad and initial grad, and then um, UPenn for business. Nice. Very good. And uh, just a little bit about your family. We, so uh, married uh, with with uh, a Colombian. <laughs> um, so I had, I, I picked up a little Spanish along the way and I have two Colombianitos, both boys, um, 12 and, uh, and seven. Uh, and uh, yeah, living, living right outside of Fort Lauderdale. Well, um, podemos hablar en español si quieres. Podemos, pero no todo el tiempo. <laughs> Perfecto, gracias. All right. And then, um, just a little bit, because you have a great job. Do you mind just painting a little bit of a picture of your career arc? Absolutely. Um, so I actually started out in um, asset management and kind of the, the world of finance, mm. um, public equity, private equity, um, and then um, a little wealth management. And it was at the at kind of the tail end of that, about the third of the way through my career that I fell in love with all things people and change and transformation and have frankly never looked back. Um, and so I've been in and out of consulting and in-house um, in some area of talent, um, standing up, redesigning, transforming um, different parts of the talent function. And how long have you been at a Royal Caribbean now? Pardon? How long have you been at Royal Caribbean? Oh, uh, six months actually almost to the day awesome well happy anniversary <laughs> if it's close enough and then um and i'm really going to be interested to talk about some of these change management things and stuff that you're talking about um and then lastly uh when you're not at work uh, what do we find you doing running around to kind of wrangle the kids <laughs> a, little it's, it's bit. a couple of e hosts around it's it's yeah um but otherwise i i I'm, i devour um Kind of any and all things around experience and behavior and i kind of geek out so i don't mm -hmm. i wouldn't say like i have a hobby hobby that in many ways is my hobby um and that we can talk later about kind of how the personal intersects with the work i i, I i'm not good at drawing those boundaries no i think that's that's <laughs> cool well, actually one of the things that we can talk about is this notion of work-life integration Hmm. Sometimes people um, talk about work-life balance, hmm. and what that sort of implies is that they're in conflict with each other, and we're just yes. trying to minimize 
you know, the disequilibrium between our private life and our, our work life. And uh, one of our friends and collaborators is Dr. Andy Garrett, and he's the one that really taught me about work-life integration. That's really mm-hmm. how you flow state is when they're working together, they actually compound each other in a positive way instead of- I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so I think that's cool. So when we first started getting to know each other, just immediately one of the things that you started talking to me about was bringing simplicity and clarity to HR and and that we have this tendency to overcomplicate things. Mm You know, so, so maybe if you want to just start there, I know that, that you've talked to me before about, you know, we live in a VUCA world and sometimes we fall into all that. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I would say it's not even just an HR thing yeah. uh, because HR things should be business things to begin with. But um, it, I think that with the speed unfolding and ever present, and, and it's funny, I remember one time somebody saying, um, the world will never be as slow as it is today. That's true, yeah. That world will never be as simple as it is today. And it's kind of daunting when you think about it that way, but it's very true, right? And so um, it, as things continue speeding up, uh, I think it's just, it, it's becoming such an imperative to make sure that that clarity is there. And oftentimes clarity comes along with simplicity. The more convoluted a message, the more things in the pipes to deal with, the greater the kind of, really the cognitive load is on us, the more we have to multitask, and we all know multitasking is a myth anyway, right? Um, there's only so much that we can hold. Now I'm gonna going into the, the the neuroscience of it. There's only so much we can hold in our mind at any point in time, and there's only so much we can process. And so I think it's more um, of an imperative for leaders and organizations and managers and everybody and, and HR um, to to simplify and to clarify and to hone in on what's the North Star, where are we going, why are we doing that, Um, and to do so consistently Mm. because there's just so much noise in the mix. It becomes so much more challenging to to make the right decisions, to understand the real picture um, and the problems we're trying to solve and kind of coalesce the team in the direction to do so. So with the complexity part, how much of that is of our own creation and how much of it is external? So I do think in HR and talent, um, we tend to want, I do think we we often make it more complicated than it is. I remember way back when, this was like when I first started in the business world, you know, we're all like, and kind of, (laughs) you know, like we're eager and we want to take on the world. And I just remember back then certain concepts being so dissected and frameworked and two by twos. And as this is speaking as an ex-consultant, right? Like I love two by twos, but, 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 but there's just so much unnecessary complexity. You lose track of the real picture. You lose track of like why we're here. You lose track of the humanness of things. Um, and, and, and it doesn't need to be so just like, what are we trying to do at the end of the day? Even, even concepts like employee experience, you know, you can slice and dice or engagement and like, okay, at the end of the day, it's really pretty simple. Easier said than done, I know, but like, do people feel like they, they can show up every day as their whole selves? Do people feel mm-hmm. like they can they can do their best work? Do people feel like they belong there and they're included and their voice matters, right? Like, and of course, those are touching about concepts that we already know and kind of are near and dear to us. But I just think sometimes we make it too complex and then for ourselves, and then we, we get weighted down by, or kind of, we have to hold up the weight of all of the systems and processes and check the box. And, and then we wonder why kind of people aren't as engaged as, as they could be. I, I wonder, this might be really crass, so I apologize, but if sometimes the creation of all these processes is actually sort of job security, well, well if somebody's got to keep all this stuff going and like, look at all this, all these complex rocket systems that we've got here. I've never uh, come across people who I felt were creating those things for themselves and their own mm-hmm. kind of exist, you know, existential kind of identity. I, I don't know that I've come across that. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a desire to make better. It's a desire to serve our clients. It's a desire, you know, when, when, a, when a manager says, well, but I don't understand X thing, or a leader's like, well, but I don't understand. How do you, you know, what do you mean by making that? What do you mean by potential? And so we're like, okay, let me tell you the definition. And I'm like, well, how do I communicate with, that with my people? Well, let me give you the framework. And, the, and the, there's this constant desire to, I think it's coming from a good place, but 
let me give you more. Let me add more clarity. Yeah. Let me add more distinctions. And then, and then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, wait, where, where did we start? Why are we doing this? Um, and so it's just a matter of simplifying and stripping away some of the, the, the corporate ease, uh, to just clear again, back to that clarity and the simplicity to, to just make it real. I wonder if there's a Marie Kondo quality here in the sense of like, oh. You, you know, like if, if we're going to introduce one, pro, we're going to get rid of something else. Oh, I love that. But what a great, actually, I have to be honest, like that's a phenomenal, I don't know, hashtag or something like the condo, <laughs> to very kind of the business world or the, the, it's what a great idea. It's sort of HR. I don't know if the water. bringing you joy concept would, would go like, exactly. does it, it, does it, does it, it does serve a need? Does it spark joy or not? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's funny. Um, you talk about emphasizing the human element. That sort of sounds obvious on its face, but I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit. Like, what do you really mean by that? What was the first word? Forgive me, the what of the human the, element? The, the, the human element, oh, emphasizing the, the human element. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's it's people, right? I'm, I'm glad that our kind of the world has realized and the corporate world has realized that our greatest asset always ever will be our people. Um, and uh, and so what does that actually mean, right? Um, and you've seen through through the years, through the decades, a, 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 a humanizing in some sense of that experience where we're now talking about things like empathy, we're talking about belonging, we're talking about these concepts that previously just weren't really part of the, the, the narrative or um, uh, anywhere near as much. And I think we still have a ways to go uh, in terms of um, really the things that make people tick um, and, and understanding that um, accessing the highest and best self of people in service of the shared goals we have as an organization, as a business requires um, an understand, a real understanding of how people work, mm -hmm. um, full of idiosyncrasies um, and messiness and emotions. I mean, emotions, right? Even that is a thing that appears like, oh, just manage or put them aside or box them in or like in spite of. Well, now we're learning that no, emotions are a critical um, element of, of, of how we operate. In fact, one would argue that the neocortex, you know, it's, the neocortex catches up with the decisions that our emotions make and then we justify it right uh, thereafter. And so what do we do? And now that touches on the change management element that you were talking about. How do we, um, how do we use that for the sake of our people, for the sake of helping them thrive uh, in service of our shared goals um, and, and, really embrace all of those elements that make us who we are, especially I would actually argue in the age of AI, um, you know, right? You're seeing how, and and that kind of opens up. I know I saw your body language, a whole different can of worms, but it's not an or in that situation either. It's an and. And so the te technology and the speed at which it's advancing and the things that now it's able to do, it really makes us focus now more than ever on what is our role. Yeah. Um, as human beings, how do we tap into that? How, what is our highest and best use? And how can organizations access that and tap into that uh, in this new age that we're in? Okay, so maybe an unfair question. Lots but of things as, there, I know. No, as, as, you as you think about what our highest and best use is, does your mind go in certain places? Like it's probably going to be found here or there? Well, it gets down to arguably the definition of what, what is the thing, what, what does human mean? I don't know if you want to get that conceptual, but what does it mean? There's an element of creativity, yeah. innovation, connecting of dots, decision making. Mm. Um, and then, of course, in other in, in, in vocations and other like there's there's there is the actual manual like things that only for now maybe people can do or people do best. And that's great, too. Um, there's only so much I think that AI can um either displace or challenge in that sense. But it's really, I think, raising that question and I don't have the whole answer by any I, I, I think part, for, for yeah. me, you used the word earlier, but but the word empathy. A yes. machine will never be empathetic to the human experience. True. Right? And so if we think about something that Royal Caribbean does, 
You know, mm-hmm. you are bringing people together. You're taking them on adventure, right? You're expanding their horizons. AI can't do that. We're cel- helping them celebrate life's greatest moments. Yeah. You know, yes. And so, so you need to be human to understand what that feels like and then how to go create experiences that mm. create that joy that people find when they're celebrating life's greatest moments. And mm. a computer's never going to figure that out because it doesn't feel. It doesn't feel. Um, I'll go all the way to the extreme. I do think, though, that it's going to it's becoming incredible at pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. So in an algorithmic way, dare I say, and that's even becoming old school from an algorithm standpoint, but I do think it can piece together the moments and the likelihood of those being moments where and when. But but there's nothing like that human element. That's why the, that's that's why I think we're living so much more in that world of experiences right now, right? And it's certainly impacting our industry. People are are dying to have those experiences that, especially during COVID, they yeah. just were lacking. And yeah. so there's a backlog and a desire, as we're seeing, um, to to really want to lean in that, into that. Um, and it's very understandable. So at least for now, those experiences, as you're mentioning, are are oh so human. Uh, and that human contact is so very important, of course, uh, and the understanding and the empathy and the connection to feelings. Um, it's huge. No, we are getting a little existential here by accident. <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to need more coffee to continue. But, um, but they, part of what you said, Amos, that, that you're, you're making me think about here a little bit is what does it really mean to be human? Because we're human beings. We're not human mm-hmm. doings. AI is doing, right? But we're human beings. Mm. So what does it really mean? to be human when you start to separate just the doing part from the being part. Mm. Oh, you know what that sparks in me? Um, and I learned this, um, shout out to the Trium group right now, um, from, from Trium when, when, when I, I, I was on the team. Um, the cycle of be, do, have, it really does start with being, doesn't it? So what do I mean by that? Most people think that uh, if I only had X, I could do Y, and then I would be Z. Mm -hmm. And in our search of being something, some identity, some aspiration of who we want to be, we often start with what we have or what we don't have to get us there. But in fact, it's a be, do, have. First, who do you want to be? How do you want to be? And then what are you going to do? And then you will have. Mm. Um, this is kind of conceptual as it, but that's that's what that sparked to me when you're talking about being. It really is coming together very well. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So that, that's a very powerful concept. Um, so I want to jump into the, the neuroscience stuff in a second, but, but one last place I want to stop off at, because in previous conversations, we've talked about, you know, that being focused on results, not just processes, and in this elusive seat at the table, Mm. And it's not just about having processes and manuals and rules and all this other stuff, but it's actually driving the business forward. Can you share a little bit more about how you think about that? It really, it, 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 it really does start with what are we up for as an organization? What's our vision? What's our strategy? How are we going to get there? processes, tools, systems, all of that stuff are just a means of helping us get there. And at the point in time where they are no longer helpful or where they are arguably, and I think in many places, they're impeding the achievement of whatever goals we have, then we really have to rethink it. And so I think all too often, um, rather, it's easy with among the noise and the noise that we were talking about to lose track of that goal which is why, again, that clarity and that simplicity and the continuous kind of commitment to those North Star goals is just so important. Um, and and avoid getting trapped into the, the kind of the, the process loop of like, because then it just becomes check the box, right? And so many times I'm adding employees, and take your pick of the organizations. It's like, oh, it's the time to do X review and I need to check the box and I need to go here and click here and then check the, yeah, and by the end, and have you done that by that deadline? And like all of that stuff, um, weighs it down, like what is it actually about? What is a, ta- a talent review or, or a year-end performance cycle? Like, what are those conversations about? How did you do? <laughs> did you accomplish what you wanted to accomplish? <laughs> what mm-hmm. can you learn from that? Right? And like, it, it's just very, 
in in many ways simple, but 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 the processes sometimes get in the way or overshadow yes. the goal such that we lose track of them, and 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 then you you lost the script, um, and so that that connectivity all the way up to to the business to to what mm. we're trying to achieve to why the acumen from a business standpoint all of those things are so important to to to, to maintain that connection. Yeah, the connection so, seems such a light word to say. Like the connection, it's like no, it's the fuel, it's the drive, it's right. Um, well, yeah. no, I, I appreciate what you're saying because we see this with our clients on the the career coaching side, where in the resume writing process, the storytelling, you know, it's how did you actually impact business results, and and what people will talk about often is their scope of responsibility. Mm. It's like, okay, well, that's interesting. That provides some context, but people get, this is really rude. People get fired for not doing their scope of responsibility. That doesn't actually tell me, did you, did you do something? And we teach people, I'd love for you to react to this, that, you know, if you kind of boiled it down, that either you help the company make money, save money, or mitigate risk. Like, like the values kind of distill down into those three pillars and there may be a different, we've talked about frameworks a minute ago, but, but that, that, I mean, like, seriously, you know, because we were able to reduce the time to hire mm. that allowed us to be more fully staffed, which allowed us to, you know, hit a sales objective because this part of the business was fully, that we were fully staffed on a ship so that we could, you know, make more money. You know, we were able to reduce the cost per hire or the time to hire, which saved us money because we mm. took it from, you know, it cost $729 to $436 per whatever. Like, do you understand your contribution to business results? Well, I think that conduit is key. Um, understanding, um, well, it's linked to so many things that I want to touch upon. So one of them is purpose, right? Um, if people don't see the bigger picture, if people don't understand what they're doing over here and how it impacts in a ripple, butterfly, whatever you want to call it, hopefully it's not a butterfly, but that's a little more esoteric. But but if they don't understand what they're doing and how that impacts, you know, our overall business results or, or mission and vision, then 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 it's very hard for them to be engaged. So there's the element of kind of purpose and connection too. Um, I'm sure some of your listeners have heard this, but and I'm going to botch it up for a second. But there's that whole story about uh, men or people building a cathedral, um, and you, you somebody walks up, see some bricks ahead of them, and they ask the worker number one, "Hey, what are you doing here?" Well, don't you see I'm putting bricks on bricks, uh, uh, um, and I'm I'm putting the mortar. I don't even know all the words, but I'm, I'm putting them together. Okay, great. Go to worker number two. What are you doing? Well, you see, I'm building this building. I'm building this, this cathedral. And people are going to come in here and they're going to meet and blah, blah. And they go to worker number three. And what are you doing? Well, I'm building a bridge between man and God. Sorry, I always get a little emotional when I, th when I, when I say that. But like, what a powerful statement mm -hmm. of understanding the ultimate impact of something. And yes. so um, as you think about that, that connectivity, it's just so very present going back to that element of human. Like if... People want to feel valued. People want to do their best. People want to put their best foot forward. And, and we need to help make sure that that clarity and that connection to purpose uh, and mission is, is there. Well, which brings us back to your model of who do I want to be? Yeah. Right? right? And is this helping me become who I want to be yeah. or, or not? Just a super quick anecdote on that, your cathedral building thing, which, by the way, I hadn't heard before. So thank you. Um, so... <laughs> I wrote a master class on job search called Making Your Own Weather. And I had written bits and pieces of it. And I was trying to do it on the weekends and at night. And it wasn't working for me because that's not my work style. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to take this week off in August and I'm going to bang this thing out. I'm going to be done with it. So I wake up that Monday morning. And I'm, this is embarrassing, but I'm not even out of bed yet. I'm like, oh, crap. I've got to write a term paper. I, I got to write this big thing. And, and I was like, oh. And almost instantly, I felt like I got a bit of a head slap and say, no, you get to go help a bunch of people whom you will never meet, right? Find purpose in their job search, learn some things about themselves, have hope, you know, and, and a sense of autonomy and agency. That's worth waking up for. And I just blew through it. That was like one of the fastest weeks of my See, life. That's like, that's such a perfect example of understanding going back to how we work how we're wired right and that 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 ability and that understanding 
framing and reframing and storytelling. They all have something in common, which is like, what is my story? What do I want to believe? There's so many opportunities and so many different options. We can believe a gazillion things. Well, what is the belief that most, that most serves us and in service of us that we want to? And that's a matter of choice, right? What do we want? You had a choice at that point in time. I can choose to look at it this way or I can choose to look at it this way, which is true. Both are true, arguably. But man, what a different unlock, what a different opportunity there is when you reframe. And this is, goes back to neuroscience, right? Reframing anxiety, reframing nervousness, reframing all those things as we're now learning has massive unlocking possibilities wow. um, in ourselves and for others. Um, and, and understanding that, again, back to a little bit of the science behind it makes... Well, well, let, let's go, ahead. so let's bridge the gap there then. Well, what sparked your interest in kind of behavioral psychology, neuroscience, things like that? Hmm. Actually, the first time I haven't thought of, thank you for asking. Um, it was when um, I was I was at American Express and we were uh, relaunching a, a redesigned 401k a retirement benefits platform. But at the time we redesigned, we did redesigned the, the, the 401k and had to lean into pretty deep behavioral economics principles. Um, to understand things like default mechanisms and simplicity, actually, even at the time and the clarity behind that. And how do you help people not or rather see something and truly something as a gain um, versus as a loss? Um, again, similar actual framing to what you just did. And so it wasn't quite a loss, loss, right? right? But the framing of that matters um, and it's just as real. And so I think that was the very first time um, as it was a behavior shift. Uh, for many that I leaned into kind of behavioral economics, how behave, behaviors. And then ever since then, I've been obsessed with everything in that space from nudge theory and brain priming mechanisms and framing and mindsets and um, everything, everything. In yeah. So I've always been very grateful that I kind of stumbled into consumer insights, market research, mm -hmm. Because it's all about how wacky people are and how we make decisions. And like you said earlier, you know, uh, emotionally we might make a decision and then backfill it rationally <laughs> to protect our ego. Basically, uh, there's a pastor who talks about rationalize. You know, we we tell ourselves rational lies that, to like protect our ego essentially at the end of the day. But but that we are emotional creatures. We are not oh, yes. just work producing units, right? And when you when you can tap into what are the underlying drivers or what are the underlying barriers that you know are actually causing behavior, and, and maybe this is a good opportunity now to link this to change management, mm. right? So, how do you think about because you've got a good understanding? I'm sure, like everybody, it's an evolving understanding of how people make decisions, how people choose to adopt behaviors or not. How do you incorporate that in your role uh, as chief talent officer? That's a big question. Thinking about maybe like this calm, is a direct functional design, change management. Well, business. yeah, I mean, I think it always ever starts with listening. I guess first is caring, actually. Mm -hmm. Do you even care that, do you even care what makes people tick? Do you even care how they make decisions? Why? What's the, right? And that's where the listening comes in and listening comes in a gazillion ways. It can come through design thinking and focus groups and interviews and um, it can come from a deep care from uh, employee engagement surveys. It can come in a one-on-one -on -one when, when somebody's having a bad day, how do you, how do you, hold that against the bigger picture of, again, that, that whole person and, and, and human being. It comes in the form of benefits of, you know, providing support in, in the form of benefits when people are grieving uh, over lost loved ones. We learned that during COVID too. I, and in, in a w wonderful way, organizations stepped up to support their people uh, through that and, and shining a light on topics like mental health. And it's all, it's all part of that same big picture. Um, so in terms of change, now going back to your, your question, I think it always ever starts with caring, listening, incorporating that. Knowing what you don't know and understanding that you don't even know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and playing in that space. 
not assuming. And again, this goes for the collective, like in organizations and individuals. What you're making me think about is from a leadership perspective, authenticity and transparency, mm -hmm. right? Because as a leader, well, one one model would be you're the wizard, you know everything. And so we're just expect you to have all the answers and versus saying, you know, actually, I don't know. And and but I care. And so mm -hmm. and I want to to better understand how this impacts you, how this makes you feel mm -hmm. right. Uh, if it was up to you, how would you do this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in my view, that that's much closer to true leadership because it, what's the expression? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, mm. right. And again, it just all gets back to these are human beings, not human doings. So our shared uh, friend, uh, Mr. Arnie, um, he will say um, that, well, actually, it wasn't. I just lost the train of thought, but it is about how you make people feel, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and oh, this is his add-on, um, not just how you make people feel, but how you make people feel about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, yes. and, uh, and that goes to our being and who we want to be and how we see ourselves. So, yeah. Well, one of the things that we find, again, a lot of the people that we work with have experienced a job loss. Mm -hmm. and so... You, you talked earlier about grieving, and that's why we've incorporated basically mental uh, health support because these aren't cells on a spreadsheet, right? These are real people who've experienced a loss who you know, have to go explain to their loved one, like, what happened and how do you deal with this? And one of the greatest things that we're able to, back to reframing, show people is, you know, you have agency still. You've got moral yes. authority here. And... Every moment of every day, you get to choose your attitude and you get to choose your actions. Everything else could be happening around you, but you do have choices. And people that I mean, that is that sounds really simple, but it's, it's like majorly profound so because, profound because people move from being a victim to being the author of what happens next. Yes. And like you said, that just like massively changes their outlook and their energy to go instead of being depressed and staying in bed all day because the world's conspired against me to I can get up today and go make something happen. That's why we titled the course Making Your Own Weather. It's like yes. you can go make stuff happen. You have so much more control than you think that you have. And, and that's why, you know, real change management starts in somebody's mind. Mm. Huh. I never thought of it that way, but this is very true. Um, and it's hard, right? It's hard when people are in that state to really share that with them. It's very, it's, and it's, it's, it's the hardest time to believe that because you feel powerless. You feel like things are happening to you and they are in some ways, but how you choose to react to respond rather. Yeah. to that not react but respond does make a big difference yeah and you know and, and people struggle and, and we can zoom out here because this isn't just about job loss this just could be like oh my gosh this AI, AI cloud is moving in like what's that mean for me and people can get very stuck in fear confusion panic yeah. anger well and so this is a little news right our brain scans for threats God, yes. I don't remember what exactly six times, ten times. What some other people who are watching this will be able to share in the comments, but um, X times more than it scans for the rewards yes. and the positive, which is why going back to change management and the vacuum of clear and consistent communication, people will fill in that void with their own stuff, and it's not going to be good. <laughs> it's just not. That's not how it works, right? Um, and so understanding that that we are wired to see the threats more than we are the rewards, it matters. Yeah. So, so I, I learned from a friend of mine who's an expert in facial coding that there's um, six or seven core emotions. Five of them are negative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fear, sadness, contempt, anger. I'm forgetting one. The neutral one is surprise. Surprise. Mm. I just wrecked my car. Surprise. I just won the lottery, but, but I'm surprised. And the only possible one is happy. You know, I have to poke a little. Please. I have a feeling that the science is actually 
out on that. I think that it may not be as universal, the description of and the understanding mm -hmm. of emotions may not be what we think it is. I'm, I might be opening up a whole thing, but I, I think that I, I think I read research recently that stated that we think that this thing means happiness and we think that happiness is more universal than it might be. I don't know. Again, yeah. I, I welcome it to others who might be more, but I. Well, I'll go do some more digging. You brought up an interesting. <laughs> we can continue that another time. But just just picking up on the idea that, that we do change generally means a threat and we are scanning for threats. Yeah. Um, one of the things in the, that we had talked about was a little bit around DEI. This is related DEI and unconscious bias. Mm. And you had a point of view on that. I was wondering if you could share that. Well, so it's interesting. That reminds me of, I went, I don't remember the exact conference and I unfortunately forget the gentleman's name. And he was a professor. He was, he was, he was deeply, he, the, his expertise was all unconscious bias and he spoke beautifully. And now I forget, but it was like, he wrote God knows how many books and, uh, and I remember after the, the his his session, and I went up to him, and I was just of course so intrigued, and I'm like, okay, so you know all this stuff, and you're like the expert, and you know what you understand all of the nooks and crannies and everything, and so what do you do differently now, because of that? Like, how do you override? Like, surely your stuff must be better than other people's stuff. Surely your you know the way that you know now you're processing, and it was the most humbling thing that he said. He's like, no. I actually realized that I cannot override it at all. And so all I do now, he, he journals. He could be like, what do you mean? What does that have to do with anything? He's like, our biases are always ever there. They're wired in us. You can't, they're unconscious biases. So like as much as you might be aware, the ever, the first and ever reaction will always come from that spot, mm -hmm. from that source. And so the job is to design around it to design processes and systems. This is where actually they're incredibly handy to, to design bias out of processes. You think of recruiting, you think of promotions, right? Yes. Um, how do you put in place the systems to make sure that it seeps in as little as possible? Mm. You cannot count on the human element for that, unfortunately, because again, our biases will always ever be there. And then he journaled, he mentioned how, and I thought, again, fascinating. He's like, you are never who you actually think you are who you actually are is the sum of your actions. Yes. So you can think about all of the things that you want to be, but the truth, we talk about lies we tell ourselves. <laughs> mm. They either serve us, they don't, but lies we tell ourselves. And so what he does is he, he journals, and then through the journals, there he then he reverse engineers who he is. Mm. That is his was his process of self-discovery. I thought that was just brilliant and, and so thought-provoking in terms of the lies we tell ourselves. I mean, Where the proof yeah, actually yeah, is. That's, that's brilliant, though. It's like th that that notion of we, we are our true character is the sum of our actions. Arguably, all it's like yeah. a, a tree falls in a forest. Well, okay, I can think, I can have all the best intentions in the world. Does that actually make it right? What 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 matters is what we do. Yeah, and of course, what we do stems from who we want to be. Again, the we do have peace, but 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 that is the that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, for 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 anybody who's listening, that this this is like foundational book in uh, kind of decision making and how we think is uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, and you have System One and System Two. Mm -hmm. and system One is that's our default mode, and that, that's where all the unconscious <laughs> bias lives, because we need System One thinking just to survive because of all the stimuli around us. Yeah. And when things kind of don't align or we can't do something in system one, then you need to engage system two. So I, I like what you're talking about in terms of designing systems and processes that acknowledge that it's real. It is. Instead of pretending like this isn't really happening because it, it doesn't suit me for that to be true about me. Well, be that as it may, it is true. And how do we design for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good Enabling stuff. the behaviors and the actions. Um, so uh, one of the things just last week, we had talked a little bit about personas. I don't know if you mm -hmm. remember this. And, you know, this kind of monolithic, like here's one size fits all messaging style versus things that are hyper personalized. And then maybe something that's in the middle ground and, and how to create scalability and messaging yet still be able to personalize. Can you riff on that for a minute? Yeah. So it's funny, this does remind me of, and again, I keep forgetting the names of books. That's unfortunately one of my 
<laughs> weaknesses, names and dates and things, but uh, it's in many ways, I think we're heading in a world of like a, the barbell effect, right? Yeah. Where, and I think of that in terms of barbells, like there's an ever elongating tail of differentiation and bespokenness, if that's a word, but like the customization and like the individuality of what we do and how we do. And yet we all have so much, in, we all have so much more in common than not. And that's like the monolithic piece over here. Um, and so how do we tackle both the understanding of what makes us all kind of the, the, the shared elements that we have in common and not bifurcating or bifurcating even when that like differentiating us so, so much that we forget all of those things. That's that's a yes. huge pitfall. But at the same time, understanding the uniqueness of every individual and meeting them where they are. Um, and I think a lot of that. Um, uh, coming a little bit for Sokol, for Sokol in terms of like putting people in that driver's seat um, mm -hmm. is about um, not presupposing or pushing the solution. I, um, so what I mean by that is kind of bringing them in in a scalable way. And this is different than like as traditional programmatic approaches where it's like, okay, here's the thing and now I'm going to roll it out and I'm going to cascade it and then we're going to make it bespoke down there. over. Yes. But it's about creating whatever programs or structures to already go there wherever people are in a scalable way that's kind of bespoke from the onset yeah but with a shared i don't know if this makes any sense but with a shared backbone um of how you do that um at, at the center but what, what, what resonates for me and, and, and I'm, i think i'm keeping up with you but but it's when we're grounded in a common purpose right and that, that kind of gets back to you know, convictions and clarity. So if we're grounded in a common purpose, then that becomes the language that we can speak to each other, right? And, and I like what you're saying about, you know, let's focus on what we have in common, not just on what makes us different, because this hyper-tribalism doesn't and work. And it's an and, right? Yeah. Both, both are always ever present. Um, there's the individuality and the uniqueness, and then there's the things that we share in common. And so the design of any elements uh, that hit the organization as a whole have to have to hold both of those things present at the same time. Yep. And, you know, th that's where diversity and inclusion come in really helpful because you get, if we have a common purpose, there, there's something that this, this common thing that we hold true that we believe, but we experience it differently or we, we've come at it in a different way that the way that it's delivered. So it's like water takes the shape of its container. Water is the same. It's, it's always the same, but it might come in a different container mm -hmm. because that's the way that it's best received, but we're not changing the water all the time. We're not mm -hmm. reformulating the purpose all the time to suit that one person. It's the same, but the container that it comes in can be changed in a way that they can best receive the same substance that everybody else is getting. Mm. So see if yeah. that works for you. Um, last thing, I want to be mindful of your time. And this is, I could talk to you for hours. Um, because you're the chief talent officer, um, I'm very curious about just maybe some talent attributes, some talent qualities that when you're building teams, mm -hmm. when you're interviewing people, are there things that you look for that, that would be really important traits? Yeah. <laughs> Where do I start? I think, um, I think the first one is humility. Um, it's actually, I don't want to order it. I don't think it's the first. It's just one of them. Um, humility is a big one. Um, that you don't come with a preset solution I took it from what I did over there, putting it over here. There's a humility for what you don't know. There's a humility for what used to serve you isn't serving you anymore. And kind of there's that level for me that humility is an entry point into the openness of like, like personal growth and understanding that you don't have it all figured out. Um, and so for me, that's an access point into learning. And so the learning element kind of on the flip side of that is like continuously learning um, and being in it and struggling with it and, and sticking with it. Um, which then goes to resilience. Um, do you have, have you developed some of these tools to do the work that you were talking about in terms of the mindset, in terms of framing things for yourself and others? 
Mm. And then that goes to kind of team and collaboration. Um, what kind of a player are you? <laughs> you know, are you a team player? What does team mean to you? Mm. Um, and how do you support the team and, and be a part of the team um, to achieve our shared goals? Um, what else would I, would I think about? The comfort with ambiguity. I think it's kind of part of part of this mix. Uh, and and actually, it's interesting. I never thought of it. I think that that has to be that's linked probably to a little bit of that humility piece because if you're comfortable with ambiguity, I just lost the, that that train the train of thought the, the connection the connective tissue there. Um, but I think they're linked because there's an openness in both to be okay with where things are that may or may not be in your control, yeah. but move forward nonetheless. Um, and you could be like, well, what does all this stuff have to do with talent? And the few things you're looking at, but I think that matters. I think so much skills can be learned. Yes. Uh, you know, all skills every time without, no, no, no. I think a lot of, you know, the, I'm, I talk about the half-life of skills, right? Some the half-life could be super short or very long. And of course the harder skills, to, the hardest skills to learn are the, the ones that have the longest duration. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that last us most. But I think um, I think those attributes are just so important. Um, and I'll take that any day over a you know a deep, deep, deep SME and some space that has read God knows what and has I don't know how many degrees. Um, Can I ask you a question on that? So yeah. this is a frustration of mine. So you're in a position to to provide some clarity for me. Is I obviously I completely agree with you. Like these attributes, it's sort of the what you bring to the party because it's all going to change anyway. So are you humble enough? You know, are you an agile learner? Mm. Can you are you resilient? That I could riff on that one for an hour by itself. You know, the the ability to deal with the ambiguity and not have something pre pre prescribed because mm. it's not going to be right anyway. Um, but job descriptions, mm. ATSs. Like, it's like the process is geared towards, you know, well, but you don't have seven years of exactly doing this thing. You could be the smartest person, the most flexible, the most humble, whatever, but sorry, you don't have seven years of doing this exact thing. Yeah. That's so narrow. And, and, and I, that, that for me is very frustrating because I see very talented people struggling because they're, they're not checking enough of these- the Square peg in the square because, hole hyper specific requirements. Yep, I think that's I think that's a, that's an issue. Um I think I think we all need to get better at that. I think and I'm kind of parlaying into the world of education which I kind of took a little meander in my career and um it, it I think that's a Hmm. There, there's a lot of help going on in my mind right now. <laughs> I'm trying to focus. Um, I, I think it's a it's a great point where we need to rethink um, how experience. Uh, we need to rethink credentialing. Yeah. Uh, and that's also in service, kind of DI more broadly. Um, and we are as a we we need to we ourselves need to become more agile and adaptive to the realities of, of today. So you see lots of organizations toying with actually becoming or taking over for the higher ed space uh, and actively saying, actually, we will, we will train, we will do this. We will. Um, and so I think nobody's cracked that nut yet. Um, yeah. I think organizations like Minerva and others are, are doing a great job and rethinking um, those spaces all together, and you're like, well, why are you going into the education space? Because I think that that's one of the first entry point credentials um, that kind of hits the 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 the, the topic that that you bring up. And I think it's also a matter. Of, think we talk about thinking fast, thinking slow. I think it's easier, right? Not not better, but it's right. easier to say, check, 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 check among the plethora of candidates. I can say, and then this is it. Uh, but if you look at the track record of how many people and you, whether executives or otherwise, what's the success rate and the attrition rate after how many months and job, like, like, surely we can do better. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, most of it's really rooted in risk avoidance, right? Because yeah. hiring by, by its nature is a risky thing. 
right? So how do I mm -hmm. you know, reduce my risk profile? Yes. Well, you've, you've got all these things and I can document, you know, on another day, well, this person had all these things versus like, what the heck were you thinking? You took a flyer on what? But, but mm -hmm. I fundamentally do believe that the qualities that you were talking about, this natural curiosity and uh, you know, being an agile learner, because I love what you said earlier, like things are never going to be slower than they are right this minute. So like you, you need to be able to keep up with this. The, the record keeps going faster and faster. You can keep dancing. Um, but I mean, and clearly it's a balance. Like, I mean, like I'm not going to ever go be a JavaScript programmer. So I could be like the most agile learner in the world, but I'm, I'm not a programmer or you need somebody that is a CPA if they're going to be in your finance department, mm -hmm. right? You know, with mm -hmm. a certain level of responsibility. But having said that, you know, there's, there's a lot of room to allow people to grow and to bring a different perspective to an old problem uh, and then come up with a, a more unique solution because they're not in the same rut that everybody else has been doing the same thing for 17 years. You know, has kind of has those grooves burned in them too. So, mm -hmm. um, any any parting thoughts? I mean, th this has been very thoughtful, and uh, you know, what I love because it's been really organic and kind of been all over the map in one sense, but mm -hmm. I think around a common theme. Any any parting thoughts as you you know, might share something with with fellow HR leaders, particularly in the talent space? I think we're at an incredible time. Uh, for HR and talent right now. Um, I really do. It's, it's, it's very exciting for me um, and my team to, to be at this point in time. I think there's more opportunity than ever. Opportunity even sounds so mundane to say it, but um, to really make amazing things happen. Um, and um, it's, it's just a great, great time to be in this space. No, I think that's cooking. That's all the reframing. This is, <laughs> it's a threat or it's an opportunity. And I think choosing to see it as an opportunity is definitely the way to go. So AMS, this is so much fun. Uh, you bring a really fresh perspective on a lot of these things. I think a very positive energy to helping people think about some old problems in a new way. So uh, for that, I really, really appreciate your time today. Thank so, you for having me. Awesome. So everyone, thank you so much for listening. Um, you can find this on YouTube, on your favorite podcast platform. But uh, we just really appreciate you taking a few minutes with us today. And for that, thank you again, AMS. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. I know.